I'm sure you've seen the news already. Blender 3.5 was released just last week with a slew of bug fixes, a couple big speedups, and a fun set of new features. I'm Jonathan Lampow with cgcookie.com, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through all of those changes, including the ones that are important to know about, but haven't gotten as much hype. First, it's important to note that Blender 3.5 has new minimum requirements for Mac and Linux. On Intel Mac OS devices, you'll need to be running at least Catalina, and on Apple Silicon devices, you'll need Big Sur. For Linux, you'll need a distribution with GLIBC 2.28, which includes Ubuntu 18.10, Debian 10, Fedora 29, or RHEL 8. For Windows, the minimum version is still XP, which is amazing. The asset library now has an all category, which combines all of your asset catalogs into one. I've been switching between asset libraries pretty often, between my own and CG Cookies and Polyhavens, for example, so this is definitely a welcome addition. The user interface for adding asset libraries in preferences is also much cleaner and now includes a default import method, which is what we'll use if the asset browser is set to auto. A new default asset library called Essentials now ships with Blender. For now, it consists of a number of helpful hair adjustment groups for geometry nodes, but it also opens the door for Blender to ship with a wide variety of default assets in the future. To go along with those new node-based hair assets, geometry node groups can now be dragged and dropped onto objects in the 3D view and a geometry nodes modifier with that setup will be automatically applied. That's a big time saver. Pose assets were slightly redesigned to better align with other asset types in the asset browser, and the pose options were moved to a new menu called Asset. For a full course about creating assets and libraries for production, check out Kent Trammell's recent course, Cubicity. Modeling. Geometry nodes may have introduced us to the idea of storing custom attributes on geometry components, but that structure is slowly making its way throughout all of Blender. And that's a really good thing. In edit mode, you can now use the mesh set attribute operator to manually set any attribute of your selection to a fixed value. In the face menu under face data, there's a new operator called flip quad tessellation. This gives you complete control over whether a bent quad is interpreted as concave or convex, which can be really important in low poly modeling. Editing a dense mesh with many attributes in edit mode has now been significantly sped up in many cases, because the conversion from edit mode's B mesh to the evaluated mesh used by the modifiers and object mode has been multi-threaded. In extreme cases, the conversion is over twice as fast. That's incredible. It's optimizations like this that don't get much press but are crucial for Blender's long-term success. UV editing. An interesting feature that I didn't expect to see is that UVs can now be copy and pasted between meshes of the same topology. It works between UV channels, objects, and even dot blend files. The usual Ctrl C and Ctrl V hotkeys don't work in this case, but you can easily find the commands in the UV menu of the UV editor. Sphere and cylinder projections have a new method for handling the poles, called fan, that reduces stretching and is now the default. Constrained to image bounds, which locks the UVs to the space inside of the UDIM tile, received a few fixes and now works properly in all UV editor operators. Some other fixes include bringing back the UV overlay in texture paint mode, UV Select Similar now supports selecting by similar objects and similar orientations, and the basic UV Unwrap was improved to better handle some edge cases. And if you want to get faster at UV unwrapping in general, watch through my video on the top UV unwrapping tips. Sculpting. Blender's sculpting brushes now support vector displacement maps, or VDMs, which mean that any shape can be turned into a brush. This approach is really popular in ZBrush and Mudbox, so there are hundreds of VDM textures that you can find online, and now all of those same textures can be used in Blender as well. Though a lot of them have been distributed as app-specific brushes, so you may have to do some conversion. The box and lasso trim tools got a new extrude mode option, which allows you to set whether or not the depth of the new shape is tapered by the viewport's perspective or not. The hotkeys for defining remesh and dynamic topology density in sculpt mode have been changed from Shift R and Shift D to simply R, which better aligns with the rest of Blender and is less confusing because Shift R is usually redo and Shift D is usually duplicate. Nodes. One small change definitely worth celebrating is that the Geometry Nodes modifier received some layout improvements, and now it supports checkboxes for Boolean values. The visual difference between inputs that support attributes and those that don't is still a little bit weird, but at least now all the values line up. The modifier also has a new operator under the drop-down arrow called Move to Nodes, which pushes the modifier's nodes into a new node group. You'll also notice that the right-click context menu and the Add menu have been reorganized. The new add menu does take an extra click to get to most nodes because of the subgrouping, but it also makes it more manageable to navigate the sheer number of nodes, which will only increase from here. 
Remember, you can always add nodes by dragging out from any socket, and that's usually faster than the add menu anyway. Speaking of interaction, dragging a link to a socket that already has a link will now replace that link rather than swap the inputs around. If you liked that behavior, you can still get it back by holding the Alt key while dropping the link onto the new socket. And while testing this out, I also noticed that holding Alt while dragging on a node will rip it from its connections and also prevent it from being auto-attached when dropped. So if you're working with really dense node groups, this might come in handy. The new geometry nodes for this release include an image input and image info nodes. Being able to pass a reference to an image inside of a node group is hugely helpful and something that I hope comes to the shader editor sometime soon. What the shader editor did get from geometry nodes, however, is a new mirror extension type. A new interpolate curves node can be used to generate child curves if given a set of parent curves to interpolate between and a set of points for the new curves to start from. For meshes, the new edges to face groups node selects all the faces within the boundary of the given edges, the exact opposite of the face groups boundaries node. The other miscellaneous geometry node improvements include a new selection input for the trim curves node, a UV map output for the mesh primitives, a five times speed up for minor curve edits, a two to three times speed up for displaying instances in the viewport, a two times speed up for the split edges node, the option to store 2D vectors with the store named attribute node, and a boolean exists output for the named attribute node. Now, geometry nodes can be pretty intimidating when you first get started, and that's why I created a full course called Assemble that walks you through all of the tools and ideas that you'll need. Physics. There's only one physics update, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Cloth simulations with lots of self collisions were optimized to be up to 25% faster. There's not much to say about that one, but it's really, really nice. Crease Pencil. The Build Modifier, which is great for making drawing time lapses or whiteboard videos, has a new natural drawing speed mode. It uses the recorded speed at which the stylus was moving when reproducing the strokes, which results in a much more natural looking animation. The Offset Modifier can now add an additional offset for each layer, stroke, or material. Grease Pencil Sculpt Auto Masking is now a global setting and can be found in a popover in the header. There's also a new Auto Masking Pi menu when you press Shift Alt A. You can now adjust the vertex opacity in the overlay panel in sculpt mode and enable or disable the brush size cursor in draw mode. The material popover in draw mode now lets you change the fill color for materials that have fill enabled. Maybe one day we'll get all of the important material settings there since switching to the material tab of the properties editor can sometimes be cumbersome, but this is still better for now. Interpolate sequence can now use all different keyframe types and can optionally exclude breakdown keyframes like it used to. Frankly, I've never used breakdown keyframes, but maybe I should start. Let me know in the comments or on Twitter if you find them helpful. Also, Grease Pencil Copy and Paste now works in multi-frame mode. Animation and Rigging The old pre-Blender 3.0 pose library has been completely removed, and older poses are now imported as actions with named markers, which can be converted into pose assets via the Action Editor's Pose Library panel. You can now drag to the left while blending a pose to subtract it and apply the opposite of the transformation. While blending, you can also hold Control to flip the pose, or press E to extrapolate a pose past 100%. The frame range for motion paths can now be set to manual so that Blender won't update the range automatically. A new ease operator in the graph editor can align keyframes along an exponential curve and is just fun to use. Armature bone animation channels can now be pinned in the dope sheet. Select linked, control L now works in weight paint mode. You can now add modifiers to multiple F curves at once via the F curve channel context menu and the channel menu in the graph editor. And the Propagate Pose Operator's next keyframe and last keyframe options have been fixed so that all keys are now copied over correctly. Even if you know how to set keyframes though, making things move in a believable way is really challenging. Wayne Dixon's Animation Bootcamp on CG Cookie is the perfect place to practice the fundamentals, because not only are you learning to animate from a professional with tons of experience, you'll also get personal feedback from him on all of your exercises. Rendering. Cycles has a new feature in the sampling panel under lights called Light Tree, which reduces noise in scenes with large numbers of lights and physically correct settings. This change also introduces an emission sampling option for materials, which can help further reduce noise for single-sided or closed meshes when set to front, meaning that it will prioritize the light that gets emitted from the front face. The light tree does not currently work on AMD GPUs, but support for those should be added in the next release. One of the reasons I never took OSL, the shader scripting language, very seriously in Blender is that the custom nodes generated with it could only be rendered on the CPU and in cycles. That's a huge drawback. Well, in Blender 3.5, OSL can also be rendered on the GPU in cycles if it's using NVIDIA optics. That means it still won't work for everyone across the board or with Eevee, 
which means it still may not be worth spending a lot of time to make custom procedural patterns, which Blender is sorely in need of, but at least more productions will be able to utilize it. Adaptive sampling in cycles has been improved for scenes with higher light values, which is fantastic for when using physically based lights. The devs recommend using the exposure setting under the film panel rather than the color management panel so that cycles can correctly account for this, but I will likely continue ignoring that advice until Eevee has that setting as well. Otherwise, switching between cycles and Eevee is not straightforward. For more information on why physically based lights can help your scenes look more believable, check out my video on photometrics. But speaking of lights, cycle spotlights were fixed so that their gizmo matches the rendered result when scaled non-uniformly, and cycle's area lights with ellipse shapes now produce less noise. Rough anisotropic materials using the Beckman method were fixed and now look similar to the GGX method. Should you bother using it though? Probably not, the GGX default is perfectly fine, and generally better. Rendering in the viewport on macOS is now significantly faster thanks to proper metal integration from Apple. In some extreme cases, like the Wanderer test scene, it more than doubles the playback FPS, as compared to OpenGL on Mac. Compositing in VFX I bet you didn't expect one of the most exciting new features of Blender 3.5 to be related to the compositor, but it's true. Compositing nodes can now be applied to the 3D view when the viewport shading is set to rendered and the compositor is set to camera or always in the popover. Not all nodes are supported, so you can't add procedural textures or masks or use the render layers just yet, but you can blur, color correct, or alpha over to your heart's content. When motion tracking, the optical center is now preserved when changing the clip resolution. Over in the video sequence editor, the transform filter can be set to subsampling 3x3, which is similar to nearest but with a 3x3 subsample of each pixel. As its name implies, the new update scene strip frame range operator in the sequencer will update a scene strip's underlying frame range. Drivers are now copied over to new strips when they are duplicated or pasted. Lastly, scripting. A few changes were made to Blender's Python API, so not all add-ons will be automatically compatible with Blender 3.5. Changed areas include the BGL OpenGL module, virtual node sockets, the armature modifier, the data transfer modifier, and the internal mesh data structure. On a more positive note, add-ons can now directly access the USD, OpenVDB, OpenImageIO, OpenColorIO, and MaterialX libraries via new Python bindings. That should allow for some cool new functions. Well, that's all the new stuff for the release of Blender 3.5. Let me know in the comments which features you think you'll likely end up using the most. And if you'd like to upgrade right away, maybe you already have, or if you like to wait until a few inevitable bug fixes roll in. And if you want to get the most out of your time modeling, sculpting, texturing, or any of the other things that we talked about in this video, then head over to cgcookie.com and we'll get you up to speed with our in-depth Blender courses. Thumbs up if you found this video helpful, subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one.